this, this is Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. And Good Friday is coming up, so there's a Good Friday service here at the church at 6.30 p.m. Um, there, I thought I had one here. Um, yep, here we go. There are these cards in the back uh, that has our Easter schedule on it. Um, so grab one of these. This is a great way to, great tool for you to invite friends and family to join us for the service. So 6.30, Friday evening, Good Friday service. And that service will be... Uh, scripture readings and songs. So it's, it's a service of shadows. So we'll be walking through the events of Holy Week um, through scripture reading and through singing. Um, so we'd love for you to join us for that service. It's one of my favorite services every year. And then on Easter Sunday, one week from today, there will be no Sunday school, but there will be a kind of continental breakfast down in the basement at 9.15. So during the Sunday school hour, uh, come, on, come, bring your friends and family, uh, share some pastries and coffee before the service, and then our worship service will start at 10.30. And uh, we're anticipating that service is going to be full, and so come early, park far, and sit close. S sit close to one another. Uh, we'd love to make as much room as we can for, for neighbors and guests and, and all of those folks. I have one more announcement, and for that I'm going to defer to Ruth, who forgot that she was giving an announcement, and now she's coming. <laughs> so, one, one more announcement. Um, I'm going to give a talk on women's sexuality in, on the 13th of April in the morning. And um, what, what I intend is to talk about um, sexuality in general. I intend to make a safe and gracious atmosphere for all of us. Um, I'll be framing our discussion with questions that will help us think biblical, biblically about sexuality. I'll be uh, mentioning topics like abuse, pornography, purity culture, same-sex attraction. Sounds like Sounds like a lot, but actually what I'm hoping is that we'll be able to think differently and a little bit outside the box about some of these things and that it will be a place where um, I want to honor and encourage women's voices and if you're a woman, you should come. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. We're, we're a come-as-you-are church, and so we want our church in every setting, um, and specifically this setting, to be a place where it's safe to come as you are, not as you wish you were or as you wish people thought about you, but as you really are. So we'd love, ladies, for you to be a part of that event. Let's stand together. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, and I don't want to take it for granted that we all know what that means. So what is the deal with all the palm branches? What's the deal with these kids walking in at the beginning of the service? The beginning of Holy Week, this was a sermon from a few months ago, Mark chapter 11, Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, declaring himself to be the promised king, the king of the Jews, the, the promised king from the line of David. And it says in Mark 11, verses 8 through 10, Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And so we gather on Sundays to worship King Jesus. Let's worship him together. Every bitter thought 
Scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thank you. 
seated. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is the week that we see you riding on a donkey, humble, and yet you're our king, you're our maker. Lord, I ask this morning that as we listen to the word that we, we would receive the bread of life, which is you, broken for us, and that we would be able, Lord, to have the gift. You would give us, by your spirit, the gift of humility so that we can rest. Because that's what humility is for, so that we can actually rest and trust in your deep, deep love for all the things that we don't understand, for all the things that we so desperately long for, for all the things that we need, for all the wrongs in the world that need to be righted. Lord, help us to rest in the humility of the humble king. Amen. Somebody's car alarm is going off <laughs> in the parking lot. It might be yours. I, I can't see whose it is. There we go. It's... There's grace for all of us. If you have little ones, they can go down the back step for Children's Church with Jessica. Would you open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, verses 40 through 47? on page 100 in your scripture journal. If you don't have a Bible, there's one on the seat in front of you, and it's on page 801 in that Bible. Again, this is Mark 15, verses 40 through 47. There were also women looking on from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. 
A few months ago, I, I mapped out the sermon texts for this spring, and I knew that we would be finishing Mark's gospel in March or April. And when I saw that Easter Sunday is next week, March 31st, I knew that I wanted to have the resurrection account in Mark 16, 1 through 8 on that Sunday. So I didn't want to preach the resurrection two weeks ago and then turn around and now it's Easter. So I I knew that was the timing and so I began to work backwards. And locking that passage in for next Sunday led me to slow down a little bit more than I otherwise might have. And, and break the narrative, Mark 11 through 16, break that into smaller chunks. And I, I feel that most promise, prominently in this passage. I, I knew that I want to preach 16, 1 through 8 next Sunday, and I also knew that I wanted to preach chapter 15, verses 33 through 39 as its own unit, and that meant I had these verses in between. So I knew that I needed to spend at least one sermon here in verses 40 through 47. And for me, the details here in verses 40 through 47, which deal with the burial of Jesus, have not been particularly noteworthy in the past for me. I focus on the crucifixion and the death, and then on the resurrection, without much attention to what happens in between. But it's been good for me this week to slow down and meditate on these hours between Jesus' death and resurrection. So we know that he was crucified on Friday and buried that evening and then rose on Sunday morning. But what happened there in between? That's the, that's the focus here. And so there's a unique structure to this morning's sermon I'm actually going to outline the main point of the text in just a couple brief paragraphs. I think the the main point of this text is really straightforward. And then I'm going to draw out two smaller observations from details here in Mark's account of the burial. And then we're going to spend the bulk of this morning looking at three implications of Jesus' burial as we consider it in light of other passages in Scripture. So this is structured a little bit differently than I would a normal Sunday. So let's start with that main point. I think the main point in these eight verses, the reason that Mark devotes time to these eight verses, is because Jesus, excuse me, Mark is emphasizing for the readers that Jesus really and truly died, that he really and truly was buried. The gospel accounts, all four gospel accounts, are a lot of things, but what they are first is historical narrative. This is a historical account. The the gospel writers are saying, this thing that I'm about to tell you happened. There were witnesses to these things that happened. And so I'm going to tell you this historical account, and I feel constrained to tell you the things that happened and not tell you things that didn't happen. So before Mark is trying to do anything, he's trying to persuade us that this thing that happened is a true story. Because, of course, if it's not a true story, then who who cares, right? So Mark repeatedly throughout his gospel includes details that lend credence to the reality that this thing that he's talking about really happened. So these women and Joseph of Arimathea These were eyewitnesses. These were people who saw this historical event that happened. And there's these specific details that drive home the reality of it. So Mark's gospel was the earliest gospel. And when he wrote this, many of these people were still alive. You see that in in 1 Corinthians 15 when uh, Paul's talking about the resurrection. He says, Jesus appeared to more than 500 witnesses, many of whom are still alive. And Mark's doing the same type of thing here. He's saying, there were people who saw Jesus die. There were people who saw Jesus taken down from the cross. There were people who saw Jesus wrapped in a linen shroud and placed in a tomb. Not just abstract people. People like Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, 
and Salome. And it wasn't just someone that put Jesus in that tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea. And so the implication is, for the earliest readers, go talk to them. Go ask them. They saw it. So these are important details. And again, the main point, the the most important detail that Mark is trying to get across here is Jesus was dead. Jesus was fully dead, just like any other person who has died. Jesus died. So we saw that last week, verse 37. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last Verse 39, the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last. And now in this week's text, verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who is also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for what? For the body of Jesus, the dead body of Jesus. Verse 44, Pilate is surprised to hear that he should have already died. Often it would take people days to die from a a crucifixion. And so Pilate's question is, that seems a little fast. Are we really sure that he's dead? So Pilate does not take Joseph's word for it. Joseph the Jew, Joseph who's seeking to identify himself with Jesus and may have motives to get Jesus down from the cross before he dies, Pilate instead asks the Roman centurion, the executioner, the guy in charge of making sure that Jesus is dead. And what is his testimony? Verse 44, he was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he did what? He granted the corpse to Joseph. There's no question here. There's no question from Jesus' followers, and there's no question from Jesus' enemies. This man is dead. And so Pilate says, yes, you may have the body. Take the corpse. He's gone. It's over. I win. I got what I wanted. And then verse 46 and 47, Joseph takes him down, wraps him in a linen shroud, puts him in a tomb closes the tomb with a rock. And these women, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, Joseph, they saw where Jesus was laid. So Mark is just emphasizing, there's no question here. Jesus is gone. These verses drive home the reality of last week's text, his crucifixion and death, and they prepare us for next week's text, the resurrection. Jesus really and truly was crucified really and truly was dead, really and truly was buried. Jesus did not escape from the cross. Jesus did not revive after a near-death experience on the cross. He was not stolen from the cross and spared. He really died, and he will really be raised to new life. So if I were preaching this text as just part of a bigger text, that would be it. And we'd move on now to the, to the bigger point. So that's the main point here in 40 through 47. Jesus really, truly died and really, truly was buried. There were witnesses to it. So that's the main point. Now, two observations from the text. First, let's consider these women who were witnesses. You, you, you can't build a theology of, of womanhood from these passages from these few verses, but you can draw out a few observations and implications about women here. The the first thing that we see related to women in this text is something that's pretty radically countercultural in the New Testament context, in the Roman world of this day. Mark, by using, by pointing out these women and naming them, and considering them as eyewitnesses. Mark is giving them a dignity that they would not have had in their immediate culture as as women living in this Roman world. Mark is saying, Mark is signaling here by the way that he refers to these women 
that a woman does not have value or identity or recognition as an extension of or an accessory to her husband or her father or her son, which was the reality in the, in the Roman world. A woman only has value, only has identity as so-and-so's wife, so-and-so's mother, so-and-so's daughter. They have, they have no legal standing. They, they only exist as belonging to a man. And that's not what we see here in this text. A, a, a woman in Roman culture here would not have been able to bear witness in court. So if you, if you have a, a legal trial and you're looking for a witness, you don't talk to the women, you bring in a man because a man has legal standing in court. But that's not what happens here. Mark says there were witnesses and they were women. And so what, what Mark is doing here, what Jesus is doing here, what the Holy Spirit is doing, we see this in all four gospel accounts, is marking these women as image bearers and as witnesses to and servants of Jesus. So think about the logic here. A man in Christ's kingdom has value and dignity because he is an image bearer who bears witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and gives himself as a servant of Christ. Now, you could say a lot more about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, but those are, those are some of the elements. A disciple of Jesus is, is someone, a, a man who is a disciple of Jesus is an image bearer, he's a witness to who Jesus is, and he seeks to live out his life in service to Jesus. And Mark says it's exactly the same for a woman. A woman in Christ's kingdom has value and dignity in exactly the same way. She is an image bearer who bears witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and gives herself in service to Christ. So Mark would say there is no distinction. So th this is true for, we could all say things like this. I, I have been deeply influenced in my Christian discipleship by many men. I owe who I am today to a long line of men who have helped me. And my walk with Christ has also been deeply shaped by many women. I have a mother and two grandmothers who told me Bible stories and prayed with me and lived as Christians in front of me. I had women in my church growing up who spent time with me, taught me in Sunday school, took care of me, paid, paid mind to me, put up with me. There was a woman who worked at a Bible camp and volunteered in my youth group. And that woman had a major impact on me as a teen and college student. Now I have a godly wife and the women of this church. Women bearing witness to the truth about Jesus, giving themselves in service to Jesus, and I have been helped by them. And we could all tell similar stories. So discipleship or bearing witness to Christ and courage, these, these topics, these realities are not inherently masculine pursuits. These women identify with Jesus. They are his followers. They bear witness to him. They display courage in remaining near to him. Those are fundamental qualities of a disciple of Christ, both female and male. So that's just one observation from the text. Second brief observation. Look at Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a member of the council, and we don't know exactly what his role is, but being a member of the council put him squarely in the group of those who had borne primary responsibility for all that has happened to Jesus. The, the council, these are Jesus' chief antagonists. These are the bad guys. These are the enemies. And now, after Jesus' death, Joseph breaks from their ranks. And I just want you to feel how, 
how big of a deal this was and, and how, how surprising this would have been and how courageous this would have been. This is essentially a man crawling up out of his foxhole, walking across no man's land and crawling into the other foxhole and saying, I'm not on this side anymore. I'm on that side. He, he breaks rank. He crosses the battle lines, identifies with Jesus in his death. He claims Jesus' body. Says, says, in effect, I'm with this guy. He's mine. He is worthy of dignity and respect and a proper burial. I don't care about the consequences. So just feel the weight of that. This, what what uh, Joseph of Arimathea does here is just a really small taste of Hebrews uh, 13, verses 12 and 13. The writer of Hebrews says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. That's what Joseph is doing. I don't want to identify here anymore. There's, no, there's nothing for me here. I want to identify with him. Look at, look at him. Look at what he did. Look at who he is. Look at what he's done for me. I want him. I don't care what the consequences are. Just give me Jesus. So that's two, two brief op- observations. Now, let's, let's step back and think about the reality that Jesus died and was buried. What are the implications of that for a Christian? What are the implications for the fact that we serve a Savior who died and spent time in the grave? before he was raised from the dead. So I can think of at least three implications. First, because Christ was buried, your dead end, my dead end, is not ultimately a dead end. The dead ends in our life are not dead ends. Uh, One of the most difficult negative emotions is regret. Would have, could have, should have. The older we become, we collect regret. We collect missed opportunities and failures and mistakes. A big part of living a long life is looking back and saying, look at everything I didn't do. Look at everything I should have done. Look at everything that didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to turn out. Look at all the ways that I failed. The life we dream of becomes the life that we actually live. And there's a gap, isn't there? When I was a kid, I used to play video games. One of my favorite video games was uh, Madden 2000, a football game. And on that game, I'd be playing, and all of a sudden, your quarterback just tore his ACL, and he's out for the season. Well, what do you do? You hit the reset button. Not my quarterback, right? You hit the reset button and you go back and you replay that game so that he doesn't tear his ACL, so that he can keep playing. Kiddos, I'm sorry to tell you, that's not how life works. We can't do that in our real life. I thought my marriage would go this way, but it went that way. I thought I would be this kind of parent, but I'm that kind of parent. I thought I would do this for my career, and instead I ended up doing that. I wanted this kind of life, but instead I had that kind of life. And I can't hit reset. I can't go back. I can't unsay. I can't undo so three, three texts that address this reality with the same logic that flows from the gospel reality, the gospel logic of death, burial, and resurrection. If you have your Bibles, look at Romans 7. Very end of Romans 7, verses 24 and 25. Here you have Paul talking about this 
schizophrenic life that he lives. I, I want to do this, but instead I do that. I want to feel this, but instead I do that. I want to say this, and instead I say that. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You get to the end of your life and you think, this was it. I, I blew it. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So here's this failed life. What shall I do? Who will deliver me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our risen and reigning Savior. Or think of Ezekiel 37. Think of the, the logic of Ezekiel 37. This is that famous passage. I'm not going to read it all. The Valley of the Dry Bones. Many of us look at our life and it's like, it's just a valley of bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. So again, we look at our life and we think, what can I make out of this? And the answer here is nothing. It's over. But we say to the Lord, O Lord, you know. And he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So God takes us to the valley of dry bones and says, Look at your life. What can you make of this? And we say, What can we make of this? Nothing. And he says, but I can. There can be resurrection here. There can be new life here. There can be a new beginning here. I can do something with this valley of dry bones. And then finally, look at Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 22 There's this, uh, there's this picture of just this wasteland, this, this life that's been destroyed because of sin, because of unfaithfulness, because of unrighteousness. The, the people of Israel are just living in this, in this barren wasteland, and their fields have been completely obliterated by a plague of locusts. And Joel the Lord says through Joel in chapter 2, verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. So he says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. You look at your life and you think it's just cut down to the ground. There's nothing to show for it. And Jesus says, I can restore that. I can rebuild that. Jesus' burial is a hard stop, a dead end. It's, it, it appears to be a leap that fell short of the target. A life that we wanted to go one way, but instead went another way. But the logic of the gospel tells us that there is life after death. There is resurrection after burial. There is restoration after failure. There is grace after sin. New life after destruction. Handed over to Christ... The dead ends in your life are not dead ends. 
there is life for you after that thing you feel like you'll never get over. It's not over because Christ was buried and raised to new life. Second implication, because Christ was buried, we grieve with hope. And this is the passage that Dick just read a few minutes ago, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Because Christ was buried and then raised to new life, death for the Christian really is, see you later, not gone forever. I was gone this week for a pastor's retreat. Johnny and Zach and I and Colin went up to a pastor's retreat up at Mount Olivet Retreat Center just a few miles down the road. And so I was away from Christina and the kids for a few days in a row. few days in a row. I don't like being away from my, my family. And by God's grace, they don't like being away from me even though I feel like a guy that sometimes you could use a break from. (laughs) But it really isn't a big deal for me to be gone for a few days because it's only a few days. We have a face-to-face relationship, (laughs) then I'm gone for a few days, and now I'm back and we have a face-to-face relationship again that we anticipate enjoying for many years together. My absence is just a blip on the screen. Losing a loved one is not the same. Please don't hear this as me minimizing or trivializing your loss. We weep with those who weep. Jesus wept for Lazarus' death and for the pain and grief that it caused Martha and Mary. So I'm not equating the two. But what we're celebrating next Sunday really does fundamentally change the character of death. Jesus died, really, truly died. His limp corpse was taken down from the cross. His lifeless body, by now cold to the touch, was prepared for burial. The blood and dirt and sweat And filth, the ugly remnants of his agonizing final hours were washed clean by hands who loved him and were devastated by what had happened to him. His breathless, bloodless, broken frame was carefully wrapped in a linen shroud and gently laid in a tomb. Just think about this. The one who had begun life as a helpless babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger was emptied of strength and power and life and again wrapped in cloth and laid in the ground. But Jesus' burial was not the end for him. Three times in Mark, Jesus told his disciples about his coming crucifixion and death. And each time he said, after three days, I will rise. He died, but he rose again, conquering death. Revelation 1.18, Jesus says, I am the living one. I died And behold, I am alive forevermore. I hold the keys to death and Hades. Death and hell were prisons with no escape. But they're not now because Jesus holds the keys. People go to death in Jesus' timing. And when he bids... They leave death and return to life. Death can no longer hold those who belong to the risen and reigning Christ. So, what Dick read a few minutes ago in in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is not being trite when he calls those who have died those who have fallen asleep. If there is no resurrection, that's a really cruel thing to say. That's salt in the wound. 
don't make light of my loss. This loved one is gone. But, Paul says, it's really true that they are not gone forever. It really is more like a long sleep or a long journey in light of the resurrection and in light of eternity. Their story really is not over. And so we grieve, but not without hope. There is a future for the dead in Christ. They will rise. We can, as the Lord's saints, we can cry out to Jesus, how long, O Lord? And Jesus' Jesus's answer is not forever. Just for a little while longer. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. Because Christ was buried and then rose again to eternal life, we grieve with hope. Then the third implication of the text. Because Christ was buried, we are willing to die every day. 1 Corinthians 15, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30 and 31. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. Paul talked about his life as a disciple of Jesus, as an apostle, as a messenger, as a preacher of the gospel. It feels like daily death. But because Christ died and was buried and was raised to new life, that's worth it. We can die. We are willing to die every day. A year or a decade or a lifetime given to caring for a dependent loved one is not a wasted life. Sustaining a marriage to a spouse who never fully gets it, who persistently stumbles and hurts and disappoints, setting aside the freedom to separate in a situation of abuse. I'm not talking about that. But staying in a marriage that's not what you thought it would be, that doesn't live up to the expectations, that's not a wasted life. Working at a job that you do not enjoy, that does not fit your skill set or your education, but does put food on the table, that's not wasted. Investing your time and energy and money into a ministry or into a person with need is not wasted. Losing a promotion because you won't cut a corner or compromise on your conscience is not wasted. Leaving the comfort of family and friends and home, learning a new language and culture, giving your life to a people so that they may know Christ is not wasted. Even if in your lifetime none of them come to Christ. Even if, as was true for Jim Elliott and so many other Christian men and women and children, even if the people that you take that gospel message to meet you with murderous violence, that is not a wasted life and it is not a wasted death. We know the, many of you probably know the line from Jim Elliott. He, was, uh, he gave himself to ministry to, the, to an unreached people group in Central America and was killed by the tribe that he was trying to reach. He said in his journal, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We have a different time horizon as Christians. This life is not all that there is. There is an eternal life to come. So listen to these texts and follow the logic. We already read 1 Corinthians 15, 30, and 31. Paul says, I die every day as a Christian. Or Revelation 2, verse 10.
Jesus says to the church in Smyrna, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's not a wasted life, to not shrink back from persecution. And then finally, Philippians 3, 10 to 11. Paul, Paul says, I've, I've counted everything as lost for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That's like Joseph of Arimathea saying, I just want to go where Jesus is. I don't care about anything else I am happy to share in his sufferings. I'm even happy to become like him in his death if it means I can attain the resurrection from the dead and spend eternity with him. Jesus did not ultimately avoid or fear or run away from death because he knew that there was life for him on the other side of the cross. That's Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus changes our risk analysis as Christians. The question for us isn't, how can I live the longest, healthiest, safest life How can I maximize my financial prospects and career trajectory? The question for the Christian is not, how can I live my best life now? That's a false gospel. The question for the Christian is, where is Jesus going? Where is he working? Where is he calling me? How can I have more of him and where can I make him known? And I don't care about the cost because I'm going to be with him forever. So because Jesus died and was buried, we're willing to die every day to follow Jesus. So, conclusion. Jesus was crucified on Good Friday and buried. On the third day, Easter Sunday, he rose to new life. Jesus' resurrection is absolutely vital. It is the key that unlocks all of what makes the gospel good news. We rightly celebrate it every Sunday. Jesus has defeated death and irrevocably owns the future. He lives what the writer of Hebrews calls an indestructible life. And again, he identifies himself in Revelation 1.18 as the living one. I died, and I am alive forever, and I have the key of death in Hades. And next week, we're going to exalt in that reality. And I, of course, want you to hold on to it today and every day. Resurrection Sunday is the good news of this passage and of everything that the Bible says. It is true that Jesus rose victorious from the grave, is seated now at his Father's right hand, and will one day come back to make all things new. And it is true that because of the resurrection, we know, Romans 8, that all things work together for good for those who love God. And that a few verses later in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. True, true, gloriously true. Preach it to yourself and to each other every day until he returns or calls you home. But when you consider the events of Holy Week, Do not rush too quickly past the burial. Don't jump in one breath from death to resurrection. Jesus died on that dark day we called Good Friday, and his lifeless body laid still in the cold ground for many long, silent, weary hours. Friday night, Saturday's dawn, the whole of the day on Saturday, Saturday's long, dark night. 
And that's the feeling that often resonates, isn't it? In Romans 8, that all things work together for our good, we are more than conquerors chapter, Paul says in Romans 8 that we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And do you remember in that chapter what kind of eager waiting Paul says that we do? He describes the eager waiting. Is it the eager waiting of a child on the night before their birthday or of a bride the morning of her wedding? I'm so excited and happy, I just can't wait. It's not that kind of eager waiting. It's a groaning, a longing to be set free from bondage to corruption, a groaning in the pains of childbirth. That's how we often feel as we wait for heaven. I want this so bad, and I'm just not sure I can handle it much longer. That's this passage those dark hours after Jesus breathed his last, groaning, tears, weariness, defeat, but not without hope and not forever. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes with the morning. We gather on the Lord's day because we commemorate his resurrection. We don't gather as Christians every Friday to remember his death and burial. The Christian life is ultimately a victorious life. That is where we're headed. There's this great song, this is my last thing. There's this great song called Death in His Grave by John Mark McMillan. He says, on Friday a thief on Sunday a king, laid down in grief, but awoke with the keys to hell on that day, firstborn of the slain. The man Jesus Christ laid death in his grave. On Friday, crucified, dead, and buried, but Sunday's coming. Let's pray. Father, we feel the grief of Good Friday. We experience the pain and the loss and the disappointment and the failure of Good Friday. We live there. We look at our lives and we see a lot of dead ends, a lot of false starts, a lot of mistakes, a lot of regret. We can, we can resonate with Ezekiel and say, Shall these bones live? What should we do with this body of death? What do we do with this valley of bones? Is this not the end? And in Christ we say, this is not the end. We grieve, but with hope. Jesus died and was buried, but he is the living one. He is alive forevermore. He holds the keys to death and hell. And so we grieve, but with hope. Help us to wait. In Jesus' name, amen. And so that's the, the picture of the Lord's Supper. The logic of the Lord's Supper is Jesus saying, come, come and commemorate my death. I said that last week. When we, when we take the bread and the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. So this is the, the, the hard reality that Jesus died and was buried. But Jesus says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's a resurrection baked into the Lord's Supper. Jesus says, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine which makes sense. He's about to die. I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom. 
So there's death and burial, but there's also the future hope of the resurrection. And so at the, at the Lord's Supper, we celebrate that Jesus died and was buried and that our sins were buried with him. And that through Jesus, we have forgiveness of our sins and we have the hope that we will one day celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb in the new heavens and the new earth with the resurrected and reigning Jesus when we are raised to new life as well. So you don't have to be a member of this church to take the Lord's Supper, but you do have to be trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And have the servers come forward. We'll pass out both elements, hold on to them while we sing, and then after the song, we'll take them together. of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Father, here at the table, we commemorate Jesus' sufficient death that took away all the sins of the world. 
and we also commemorate that he is alive and that we will one day be raised to new life with him. And so we look to him with hope. In Christ we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing one more song.
turn our eyes to Jesus this week and follow the words of Hebrews 12 I've already read. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's sing the doxology. dismissed.